Uh, hello, I'm so excited to be here and to meet all of you. I know I've communicated with a couple of you while we've been setting up this event. As Matt said, I'm the new community engagement program manager. So I would love to hear your ideas about ways that you'd love to see New Relic involved in the Portland tech community and things that you'd like to see us host here at this beautiful space. Um, one quick note of housekeeping before we move forward, we're going to do community announcements at the end. So during Q&A, if you have a community announcement, I'll call that out. And also, I wanted to give you a sneak peek of our December event, which is going to happen on December 11th. And it's going to be a partnership with our friends at Girls Inc. We're going to have an amazing fireside chat with some very powerful young women from our Portland community who are working in after school STEM programs. And we're gonna hear all about what's making them get involved and what we can do to support them. So I hope you'll come out and join us and bring your friends. Um, finally, I am so excited to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Ali Colleen Neff is the founder of cultureandcode.com, which is a global diversity and inclusion firm that's based here in Portland. As the director of the Digital Undergrounds and Digital Africa Project, she's generated groundbreaking work on how subcultures, women, and marginalized communities innovate across the global digital divide. She's worked with Intel's She Will Connect program to empower African women online. She's conducted workshops on diversity in the digital workplace, and she's revamped public works websites to appeal to low-income residents. Her books and articles include work on hip hop and the digital culture, African feminism and creative media, and she's received many prestigious fellowships. She's affiliated with Portland State University's program on women, gender and sexuality studies. And I'm so thrilled that she is here with us tonight to talk about Africa's digital revolution. I think we're going to have a really, really great conversation and I welcome you to Think of all your questions and we'll bombard her with them at the end of her presentation. <laughs> Without further ado, Dr. Ali Colleen Neff. Thank you. I am beyond excited to be here today speaking with all of you about African digital makers and users. And although I'm jumping off from the specific research topic, really it's a talk about the relationship of human diversity to digital innovation. The power we have to harness design thinking to make alternative futures. So right now, the African digital revolution is unfolding in really exciting ways. So much of this is because Africa has shown its capacity to recognize and resource innovation at every step. With engineers adapting technology to suit the specific needs and dynamics of the continent instead of the other way around. So behind me, I'm going to show you footage from the Fakogesi Afro Tech Riot Festival in South Africa. Here we go whose motto is Ungap Thelwa Innovation Yako, which means own your innovation. So you'll see some of the really exciting stuff people are coming up with across the continent right now. As I speak with you, um, I want to give you a sense of the promise, imagination, and problem-solving brilliance of the continent with the youngest population on Earth. So Africa has the youngest population on Earth. Um, there are tons and tons of young people ready to make things and put them out in the world and write themselves into the digital landscape. So I'm going to cover a few different angles of Africa's digital, digital innovation today, from the work of women entrepreneurs emerging from Intel's She Will Connect program, to social justice hackers leaking government documents in South Africa, to tween girls in Senegal wreaking havoc on conventional social media platforms by injecting brilliant co content and tagging like mad. So this is the reason why I moved from my work as a professor of global digital cultures to collaborate with members of the Portland tech community. I see so much potential um, with its with member um, I, in the willingness to experiment the sharp social consciousness, and the renewed commitment to truly diversifying tech that is part of the culture here. I've had a bunch of really amazing conversations with some of the people in this room and beyond about how we can diversify the tech landscape here and how we can really think globally about horizons, a few horizons out um, about where we might take these projects. 
So it's the reason I'm excited to be here at New Relic today. So thanks to Aaron and Matthew and the team for bringing me into the fold and convincing me that this audience would be interested in hearing from a digital anthropologist. How many people in this room have heard of digital anthropology? Hey, hey, that's really good. Okay, good. Um, so good. I have got a friendly audience. This is great. I'm hoping we can think together about how Portland's tech community can sort of unlock its brains and its bodies and its structures to approach digital innovation in new ways. So I'd love to think this through with you in the Q&A session, and I would love to hear back about how we can kind of plug this into projects that you all may have. So today I'll tell you a bit about how the field of digital anthropology is approaching the question of digital futures and explain a bit about the concept of digital undergrounds, global subcultures who are on one hand marginalized for essentially being different, but on the other are absolutely vital to new movements in digital development. I'll give you a sense of how the multifaceted cultures of the African continent have fostered digital innovation, I'll suggest how we here in the West could resource more of this work. And finally, I'll show how Portland's tech scene can become inspired by the African example to foster diversity, universal design thinking, and intellectual equity. So we're going to start by thinking about digital globalization and the digital divide. Digital globalization is a really good thing. It offers the kind of possibility that Marshall McLuhan had in mind when he dreamed of the global village or what Stuart Brand envisioned with a whole earth catalog. How many of you have heard of Stuart Brand? Oh, this is great. How many of you have been to Africa? Since I'm asking these, hey, I'm really excited. What a great crowd. Okay. So, <laughs> so Twitter um, and digital globalization. I'll talk about this in just a moment, but we're hopeful that the possibility, we are hopeful in the possibility that digital globalization will be democratizing and equalizing revolution. This dream is what industry forces like Facebook, Microsoft, and a series of global telecom companies are tapping into as they finish laying 500 miles of cable throughout West Africa. In fact, the UN has prioritized the availability of broadband throughout the global south as it anticipates how important digital equality will be to the emerging world economy. So we might think about the Twitter revolution, which harnessed problematically, I might add, but that's a different presentation, social networking platforms to bring big regime change to both the Middle East and to vast areas of North and West Africa, even my field site of Senegal, which is quite a bit south um, of this, the center of the Twitter revolution. Or we think of the work of entrepreneurs, African entrepreneurs, like Mark Shuttleworth with Ubuntu or Elon Musk of many, many tech endeavors and lots of other things. Um, but in addition to the great possibilities it carries, we also know that digital globalization has given rise to all kinds of digital divides, which is a way of talking about how the global village we like to envision has really become an uneven landscape. So we've got a lot of work to do here. There are issues with... Uneven access to software, hardware, training, and infrastructure. So as you can see, huge swaths of Africa are actually down to four computers or less for every hundred people. Okay. Uh, there are also issues with, and this is another can of worms, and it's one I'm interested in talking about more um, if you want to hear more. This is of particular concern to me. Digital depictions of African people. Right here we have um, Robbie, poor Robbie, um, on humanitarians of Twitter. Have you heard of this? Humanitarians of uh, Twitter, excuse me, humanitarians of, uh, uh, what is this dating platform? I can't think of it. Tinder, exactly, excuse me. Yes, so humanita humanitarians of Tinder, right? So the whole trope there, it was about four or five years ago, there's this whole trope where people were standing with human beings from other places and showing, this is a way of showing in one photo or less, their cosmopolitanism and their humanitarianism. And um, of course, that's really tricky. We don't see the agency on the part of the people who are in the photo or something like Coney 2012. I'm sure you all remember that campaign 
just this huge campaign. It was really all about the textures of social media. And it was started by some Californians who had the idea that they would, you know, revolutionize um, the political landscape of uh, this part of the East and Central Africa. And it flopped pretty terribly. And a lot of people wasted a lot of time. And again, we see this thing where Africans are being looked at, but they're not able to make representations of themselves. And that is a part of the digital divide we sometimes have a hard time talking about, but it's a very important one. And I'll talk about it more today. And then finally, we have um, the way that Western corporations are mining conflict minerals for mobile phones from the Congo or these growing digital dumping grounds throughout the global south, like millions of tons of electronic waste littered throughout rural Ghana. So I saw this all over the beaches in Senegal, just all kinds of discarded monitors and other kinds of waste that are undumpable. Um, in the U.S., for instance. But if this is what the digital divide looks like from the outside, tonight I want to show that African digital futures can look very different from within. Emergent, experimental, saturated with sensory experience, attuned to the social worlds of those often ignored by the de big developers. So I'll give you three examples of digital creativity before I move into the question of what all of this means to those of us here in this room. And I want to begin with the story of Caroline. One way Africa's digital future is emerging is in the form of tech entrepreneurship and social problem solving. So I've been lucky enough to collaborate a bit with NGO platforms like Intel's She Will Connect, which is training African women to make digital platforms that can transform their local economies. So I really, really love this story, and I'm excited because I'm um, able to, to speak a little bit with Caroline and find out more about her journey. So this will give you a sense of what she and her community are up to. My name is Caroline Mamboy. I live in the Mukuru Kwajenga slums in Nairobi, Kenya. In my country, people are dying. People who needn't be. We don't have a national organ donor program. Instead, we have back alley clinics where the organ black market thrives. Many of us have been approached to sell our organs. In 2014, my uncle needed a kidney. In the family, no one had his match, and it took too much time to find a kidney in the black market. So my uncle passed on. He was really a big part of our lives as a family. There are lots of stories like my uncle's. I wanted to change this. When Intel came to our school and taught us of Intel XDK, a mobile programming language, I came up with an app that links patients to donors and to hospitals. I gathered a few friends of mine and told them of the idea, and they decided to help me. None of us knew how to code, but with the help of our teacher, Intel XDK was easy to learn. The response has been amazing. Hospitals across Kenya are joining us. We're giving patients and families another shot at life because everyone deserves that. We have some good news for you. So we talk a lot about training women and girls and marginalized global populations to code. And as we know, it's extremely important that communities have access to the nets and bolts of digital making. But I also think Caroline's story shows us that rather than orienting our work to teaching young people to code what the tech industry already wants, right, to sort of include them into the, the digital landscape as we already imagine it, we can teach African girls, for instance, to code things African girls want and need. And how do we know what that is until we let them experiment and give them the space and more importantly, the resources to do that for themselves, right? So to that end, I want to highlight how important African hackers are to the global digital landscape. They're thinking up new ways to engineer digital solutions in response to emerging problems. 
from famine to political upheaval. African hackers take advantage of the continent's remarkably open telecom infrastructure. Where protocols and hierarchies are not consolidated or cemented in place, there are schemes for creativity, as I'm sure plenty of people in this room know. In fact, the continent has always been at the cutting edge of mobile technologies, right? This is one of the first places on the planet where people were using cell phones long before your average American had access to that. So I really like the way Ethan Zuckerman describes African hacking in his essay on the topic in Wired. He says, one trip to sub-Saharan Africa is all it takes to demonstrate the misconceptions about Africa in the digital age. Wireless ISPs were common in the Ghanaian capital of Accra before public Wi-Fi nodes were widespread in the U.S. My hacker friends in Lagos worked from ca taxi cabs, logging on to 4G networks. In Kenya, 70% of adults use M-Pesa, a phone-based payment system, to buy groceries and send money to family. On much of the African continent, telecoms infrastructure is world-class, whereas transport, power, and other infrastructures lag far behind. Kenya has the best-developed mobile money infrastructure in Africa and has nurtured iHub, a co-working space for tech entrepreneurs. So we'll talk a little bit later about what we can do about this power problem, because that is a huge issue in African digital development, and it's one that I witnessed being a problem throughout my time in Senegal um, throughout the continent. Um, one of my favorite projects in the history of African hacking is VPN from Uganda. Anybody hear of this? Okay, I gotcha. I got the whole room on that one. Okay, a really brilliant conglomeration of shoots and ladders by which citizens learn to work around the government's prohibition of news and social media sites. And if you Google VPN, VPN from Uganda right now, you can find there are all these bountiful ways that anybody can figure out how to get on a VPN um, at any time in Uganda. So it's the citizens basically have all of these ways to work around government prohibitions. And then there's a third example I want to talk about tonight, and it's one I think you will all think is really fun. And it kind of answers to that question of digital self-representation and self-writing. And it's also a really fun example. It has to do with the high value many African cultures place on the arts and aesthetics as critical tools of communication. The digital landscape is a highly visual and highly auditory space. It's exciting to see how young people have harnessed the power of sight and sound and the senses to influence digital production. So how many people in this room know something about Nollywood? Nollywood, okay, a few, great. Nollywood is the biggest and the earliest of the contemporary African film industries. Its, it's mark is the use of low-budget CGI technology to really spectacular, amazing ends. And it is a meme gold mine. And I'm going to share with you one of my favorites, African Batman. And so we'll watch about a minute of this, and I'll, I'll explain to you why this is actually important. Um, but I want us to think a little bit about what the production values are here, knowing that this is a relatively low budget film. So here we go. Today is a wonderful day. Because the princess of this kingdom, my daughter, is right for marriage. We are going to have a wrestling contest. And whoever that wins, Turn the volume down. I think of Nollywood as a really important example. I'll let it play behind me because I know you're all dying to know what happens next. Um, I think of it as a really, really compelling creative misuse of a digital design platform, an intentional misuse, something I call an off label engagement with digital platforms and media. To make digital art that's influencing the world, 
Um, there's this notion that CGI is meant to make the virtual look real, um, but Nollywood is not, is not valuing that in the way that we want to value that in Hollywood much of the time. They want it to heighten the textures of the surreal. Make no mistake, these are intentional choices that have helped to make Nollywood a global phenomenon. This is why we enjoy it so much. It's a radical misuse of the platform, and as such, it saturates the senses. It gets our imagination going, and it's worth valuing, right? So there's a lot of literature out there where critics are saying, well, hopefully one day Nollywood will catch up. And they, they don't. They're, they are coming from a different place and they're doing something different and it's awesome, right? And in fact, maybe Western filmmaking will catch up with Nollywood in the sense that when you see sort of a high budget version of this, okay, good, it's me. When you see a high version of this, um, well, I'll say this, we have low budget movies like African Batman, right? And then we have higher budget Nigerian cinema that holds those same production values, the surreal, the possible, the experimental, but with a higher budget. So this is a film on Yamoja, the African mermaid goddess by Nigerian British filmmaker Nosa Egbenedio. And I'm sure plenty of people in this room can recognize the similarities between this filmmaking and, for instance, Beyonce's uh, video album for Lemonade, right? There's a lot of conversation between the African popular arts and the African digital arts and our most cutting edge American uh, media makers. So this willingness to think differently about digital design captivates filmmakers in the West. I'm sure many of us can see the parallels between this and plenty of other emerging music videos, for instance. So Nedi Okorafor, the African writer says of her work, my science fiction has different ancestors, African ones. In turn, I want to consider the possibility uh, that, life, uh, that the life of African digital creativity also has ancestors of its own. It's got its own trajectory. It's got its own uh, background. It's got its own genealogy. And in turn, this off-label use of digital technology is at the heart of African digital futurism or Afrofuturism, a field that bridges the creative and tech industries. Science fiction writers, for instance, are teaming up with game developers, like in the clip that we saw at the beginning of this talk. Afrofuturism is really exciting because it offers an alternative vision for the ways humanity can unfold in the digital age. So I want to give you a sense of how I got into this field of digital anthropology. It sounds like plenty of you already have a sense of what this is. Um, I started doing this about a decade ago. And how it's come to matter in the digital diversity projects I've been able to do in the world of tech and here in Portland. And I also want to take a beat to suggest what the tech world at large can learn from African creativity. While many of us think of anthropology, we think of the past. One branch of the field, archaeology, is literally about unearthing objects that can tell us how people used to live. My field, cultural anthropology, is often misunderstood as being concerned with lost ways of life, or communities thought to be somehow pre-modern. But ever since African-American anthropologist and Boasmian anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston showed us how black popular music like the blues could spread and influence global cultures, Anthropology, did you know she was an anthropologist in addition to a novelist? She's a trained anthropologist, Columbia trained. Um, it's turned its attention to the ways global and marginalized communities navigate and innovate in contemporary times. So there are three keywords I want to think about today. Digital undergrounds, digital divide, and off-label uses of digital technologies. So at the core of my work is an interest in a group of digital makers and users I call digital undergrounds, subcultures, global communities, and marginalized groups whose creativity offers so much to new movements in digital design. Many of these practitioners fall across the invisible digital divide, places where technology training and connectivity are hard to come by. And I argue that what these digital undergrounds tend to do is to use digital hardware, software, platforms, and media in off-label ways, meaning they bend it, mispurpose it, combine it, or otherwise hack it to suit their needs. So the cultures we study are highly complex and attuned to surviving and thriving in changing global circumstances. 
Following a book project with hip-hop producers in the U.S. South, which I began to research in 2004, um, around 2008, I started to realize how important these off-label digital media uses are to marginalized youth. So I'm looking at underground hip-hop scenes in Oakland, for instance. I'm working with underground hip-hop producers in Chicago. I'm looking at video makers and um, homemade documentary makers in the Mississippi Delta, which is where I really generated my first research. I decided I wanted to go to Senegal because I wanted to think about a rapidly urbanizing African landscape and how young people in these places were using digital technologies to, to write themselves into the world, to say who they are, where they're from, and what their values are. And I found this immensely important. So I went to summer camp and I immersively learned the Wolof language because I wanted to work with youth on the outer edges of the city um, who don't speak uh, French as often and who are far less likely to speak English. And so I really wanted to get to the heart of what people who have less access to conventional modes of digital making were doing. And I met these amazing people like this woman, Tusa Senarap, who says hi to everyone. She knows I'm talking about her right now. Um, she runs a feminist recording studio in a um, Dakar suburb called Gejuai. This is Dakar, Senegal. A suburb called Gejuai. And it's a, it's a very poor um, neighborhood in the outer suburbs of Dakar. Uh, power is only working maybe sometimes half the day, sometimes not. I mean, large swaths of time go by with no power, no connectivity. Um, and she's really using digital production in these amazing ways. She's got, um, of course, there's no uh, local media industries per se. So Senegalese artists are distributing their work through online platforms only. They're not charging for it, but they're using it to build prestige, what they call personality. Um, and then they can start to get the interest of maybe American NGOs who can give them visas and bring them to the U.S. to perform and set up showcases for them in downtown Dakar for exchange students. Right. They're using she's doing things like making these highly visible flyers and that, that distribute very easily over social networking sites. And then she'll put them up on her Facebook page and tag her top 50 friends, each of whom has the most friends. And one of the practices in Senegal is to know it's very rude not to let people tag you. So if you ever look at a Senegalese Facebook page, it tends to just be filled with flyers and advertisements for your friends or sometimes just really cute photos. So it's all about building prestige and personality. It's all about who you know. So there is this whole other political economy that is unfolding online in the work of these young people that we don't really, in the West, don't really have a way to, to conceive of or to talk about yet. So I want to be some of that connective tissue. Something else I did was spend a lot of time. Senegal is a 96% Sufi society, um, Sufi Islamic society, which is really amazing. And so one of the coolest things I was able to do was to witness Sufi digitalities. Okay, this is important. So this is my friend, Sofna Hadiba. Um, and she, is, she makes videos. She's a Sufi praise singer. And she makes YouTube videos that are meant to be broadcast into the living rooms of Senegalese people who have been dispersed all over the globe. Because Senegal is in part of uh, the famine that the entire Sahel, the entire middle part of Africa, has been experiencing for some time. People are in extreme poverty, and they are doing anything they can to go abroad and find work and send remittances back home. What happens then is they become out of touch with their Sufi dieta or their worship group. And so what they do, because the sensory experience of being in that worship place is so important to them, they make these videos and they broadcast them and they become, they can enter religious ecstasy. They chant along with it and they can actually um, have that religious experience while very far from the source of, of the Sufi worship. And then we see things like, cassette tapes that have been digitized by the Sufi faithful and then put up online on these Sufi, Sufi web pages. So I think Sufi web design is really fascinating because it's really saturated with images and media and sound, right? And I think that's really important. And the moment when I realized, I think it's coming right along here. 
Yeah. The moment when I realized that I wanted to take my field work in Senegal, the digital route and really focus on this was this is a photo I took in a praise chant that Sokhna Hadi was conducting. And this was 2010 or 2011. And I was there making my digital video and being the anthropologist. I had been working with her and her collective for about a year and a half at that time and practically moved into her house. We were very close, which is cool because I was comfortable being in the space and people were comfortable with me, which is really great. So there I was standing on the stage and doing my anthropology thing and recording this for posterity. And I look up and nobody needs me. They've got 50 video cameras on this woman, right? And this is before a lot of us were really using mobile video technologies. They are all recording this. And what is fascinating to me is the way that this media reverberates through the digital sphere. So all of these people made these things. And what do they do with the recordings? Eventually, some of them would upload them. Right. So you can find my film of this event, but you can find maybe six other videos of this event on YouTube. And they are these, they're all stacked up on top of each other and you can move from one perspective to another. Right. Which is fascinating. But more so people are recording these things to SIM cards. And then the next day when they are having tea with their friends, they are swapping their SIM cards and copying them. Right. And this is how they're distributing the recordings of the event. They're distributing these field recordings. And all of a sudden, you can, you take a SIM card from one of the guys drinking tea around the table and I could plug it into my computer. And I had a traveling archive of 10 years of recordings of amazing Sufi chants. Right. So this is a remarkable usage of these technologies. And these are the kinds of ad hoc problem solving, what I would think of as engineering, really, that these young people are doing. So my work on African digital innovation is inspired by the thinking of one of my grad school mentors, Ashila Mbembe, an eminent professor of philosophy at Witts in Johannesburg, who writes about digital Afropolitanism. He says, Africa is the region of the globe with the youngest and most dynamic population in an aging world. It is entrenched cultures of curiosity, invention, and innovation, long underestimated, neglected, or misunderstood. People are so constantly forced to innovate both in ways of being, ways of thinking, and ways of making things, putting together again and repairing what has been broken up, bodies, schools, institutions, and symbolic systems have become the very condition for survival. Today in major cities throughout this vast continent, it is common for objects of use value to be made from apparently worthless things. Matter that already existed is folded, remixed, and welded, and blended into new combinations. Items that would otherwise be considered rubbish are resurrected. And in their extraordinary lives and frugality, these cultures of retrieval, repair, and remaking of things are the repositories of tacit knowledges and skills. So my research on Africa's digital revolution is really about the human capacity for innovation, our ability to essentially make something from nothing that can help us to survive and thrive in a world that is constantly in flux. It's about the idea of cultural response, culture responsive digital development that doesn't assume a one size fits all approach, that understands that truly universal design is about plasticity, experimentation, and the unknowable. And it's actually about the question of who counts as an engineer. I really want to help open up the definition of engineering beyond the kinds of credentials we're used to seeing and training to the heart of engineering imagining and making original solutions to emerging problems. When it comes to learning fast and to problem solving quickly and effectively, the African di digital revolution has so much to offer. So as I close out, I'm gonna visit two questions. One is how to resource African digital creativity. And the final, is, the final one is what we can do here in Portland, what we can learn from the African example when it comes to innovation. So given the incredible work that African users, makers, artists, and engineers have done, I want to make some suggestions as to how we can recognize and resource this work. I take from medical anthropologist Paul Farmer, whose work on development in human rights in Haiti has been so influential in our field. 
He says that in order to, for marginalized communities to participate in the global economy, they need three things, space, staff, and stuff. First, we need space. Some examples of really good spaces Africans have been able to cultivate themselves include K-Lab, an open technology lab in Kigali, Rwanda, and places like Rock Team Music Studios, Tusa's recording studio on the outskirts of Dakar. We need to nourish labs and studios where people can experiment and collaborate. Another solution is to build out virtual space, online platforms and conferences and practices for collaborations between Africans and Western digital makers. Secondly, we can, we can contribute to staff. This can mean funding for hiring faculty, trainers, and coaches who can not only teach coding and programming skills, but all of that connective tissue, right? Skills like entrepreneurship, human computer interaction, and digital design. We can teach someone like Caroline coding for a week and she's coming up with things like this, imagine, right? If she had access to questions of how to be a global entrepreneur, right? And let's hope that she's starting to access those questions. That's the kind of staff we'd love to send there. And then there's the stuff. Machines and hard drives are really expensive. This is the really, really tricky part, everybody. Um, in many African countries, there are regulations, import substitution. Yes, you know, um, everyone, okay, lots of people know this is a, this is a strategic choice on the part of Africans not to import goods from the West that are going to eventually tax and drain the economy or very quickly. And that being said, it gets really hard to get a hold of a Mac. It can be really hard to get a hold of a hard drive, a high capacity hard drive. Stuff is hard to get your hands on. And not only is it hard to get and distribute the stuff and to keep it, right, because it's highly prized, but you also have to maintain it. You also have to be able to fix it. And that gets really tricky in economies that are based on sharing. If somebody's got a Mac, everybody in the neighborhood's going to use it. It's going to need repairs really quickly. But it would be really not okay to not share it and to let other people, not let other people use it. So most Africans still also rely on mobile networks. How can we current existing platforms to work in places without an established telecom structure or with an unreliable power grid? Major problem. Finally, we need to find alternative modes for funding startups and projects by using tailored platforms. This is another specific one we need to work on. We need to resource these makers. But PayPal does not work in most of these countries. Most of the platforms we're used to crowd, we're used to using to crowdfund do not work in these countries, right? So we either have to Western Union them or get them cash or come up with some other platform by which we can actually get funds to these makers. So I want to turn to, finally, the question of what we can do here in Portland's tech scene and what we can learn from African innovation. How can we resource digital undergrounds and make space for the incredible work they do? So Portland is one of those places that feels like a bunch of overlapping undergrounds already. It's why I was so excited to move here, watching them collide and crash and you know, all of a sudden you've got like a, a goth hip hop prom happening, you know, it's really exciting. And I think it's a really good place for these new movements in tech. I mean, it's really exciting. So it's got, okay, as New Relic put it actually for the announcement for, for this series, it's got disruptive developers, innovative technologists and world changing creatives. Let's do this, let's do this. If this is who we are, then what can we learn from African innovation? I'll throw out a few general areas, but really I want this to be part of our discussion after I'm done talking. Uh, I really want to hear where you think we can innovate and what we could do and what kinds of collaborations we can start to think about. But first, we need to prize and foster mobility, contingency, experimentation, imagination, meaning that we have to find a way to nourish projects that may not have an immediate outcome or impact. We need more space to play in our work lives, to collaborate across companies or silos, and to loosen up the practices of designing and programming. So pop culture like Nollywood and underground hip hop can become incredibly inspiring for us design thinkers. Better yet, we can hire representatives from these industries to consult with us as we imagine new interfaces and in captivating design. 
come on, if we're doing design, why not tap into these incredible designers we were watching at the outset of this talk? We might even slow down our fast-paced, high-growth paradigm here and there to reevaluate and rethink our paradigms from a design thinking perspective. Secondly, we can orient our thinking one more horizon out than we're really used to, maybe to the three to seven year horizon, um, and then the immediate next few steps. I know it's really hard to do. There are strategists out there who are really good at this. I've been talking a lot to Michael Perman at Say What Innovation Strategy to imagine what a global horizon three innovation strategy might look like in terms of the regional tech scene. This might mean doing exploratory fieldwork and collaborations with communities of global digital makers, which I would be happy to do. I mean, that's, that would be really fun, um, which would mean just finding interlocutors, representatives in the scene and be willing to work with me to collaborate over a series of, of, of years even to see what people in their communities are doing and making and find out how we can partner with that. Uh, maybe it's holding a summit on digital futures, and this is where imagination really comes in. Another example from the, the local community that I've really enjoyed um, is the original research by my colleagues Jessica Outlaw and Beth Duckles at the Extended Mind. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but they're brilliant. Um, they've been doing work on the experience of women in virtual reality and augmented reality environments. They just put out a white paper on it. Um, so we want to be anticipating the importance of diverse user groups. That means a lot to me as somebody who does user experience research is really thinking about recruiting and working with uh, sort of marginalized users in unprecedented ways. We really have to go outside of the box to, to access those worlds. And I want to note that attending to the ways digital undergrounds approach innovation is not only inspiring and ethical, it's good for business outcomes. Across the board, research shows that diversifying teams increases productivity and contributes to strong products and strong campaigns. So finally, we can sort of trick back on the idea of culture fit, right? Within the business and tech communities, I've blogged a lot about this major concern. I've heard it uh, referred to as the culture fit straight jacket. Um, we want to move forward to new approaches to digital diversity, equity, and conclusion. So we can hire coders, engineers, and developers who do not have conventional training. And I understand that New Relic is really good about this. They've hired a number of folks from code schools, which is awesome. Now we can begin to think about how to bridge the gaps between the requirements for conventional job listings in the field and alternative modes of training in apprenticeships and fellowships that can enrich teams in unforeseen ways. We can partner with communities and representatives of communities across the digital divide. I'd love to see Portland firms partnering with African hackers, come on, with tween social media users, with underground hip hop artists, with retirees, with disability communities, and with refugees. I believe that this is who we really are here in Portland, and it's the potential of growing scene like ours to really grab onto we are global thinkers who are always willing to take a close look at our borders and boundaries and assumptions. And we are ready to take some really important steps to opening these up to true global digital diversity. Thank you. All right, we have Mike here, and I'm going to give one to my colleagues in the back. And if you have questions, you can pass them around and talk to Allie. Okay, questions or thoughts? Uh, one thing I worry about, and I've thought about this a lot, but I don't really have the tools, it sounds like you have some, is sort of the, uh, the way we do digital, the way we build products. We build a laptop that looks like that, and we do these things that are expressions of our culture and expressions of our technological uh, development path. And I'm uh, worried about basically shouting them down in the sense of here's the way you do it, here's the way it works, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so a thing I try to do in my head is they had developed technology first. 
what would it be? How would we be adapting to what their culture produced and how, would, how, how can we simulate that? How can we draw out of their past and their, fu- and their future? How, how can we imagine what they would do if they were fully empowered from, for a long time? So where do I learn about this? It looks like you're started, but where do I learn more? That's a really good question. I mean, trying to imagine, so this is what anthropology is all about, right? Trying to to imagine ourselves in the shoes of the other and deconstructing the idea of the other and realizing that we ourselves are other, right? And thinking through that, I mean, one really interesting thing I like to think about is the development, the really complex development of ideas around architecture and geometry and algebra that were emerging in Africa long before the West was dreamed of. And, um, because, you know, a lot of these technologies, we, we can get a sense of it because number systems based on five really come from this, right? So I think, um, in a sense, we can begin by flipping the script and really um, approaching uh, African cultures and African civilization as generating a lot of the basis for the tech we know today and recognizing where that emerges and giving credit where credit is due. Um, and I think you're right about making interfaces that make sense to Westerners. I mean, is in my Western, I mean, that's a complicated term. I could do another 45 minutes, but I'm sure you all want more pizza um but uh you know but but here you know uh, beyond uh, the global south uh it's a lesson that we all can learn let's start there and take them as innovators some of us are them first of all but uh take them as innovators and and start to think about all the all of the ways that what we do really takes a page from their book um so that might be a place to start Anthropology is really good. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Brian Larkin has some great, you know, the kinds of stuff I'm drawing from really are in the field of media anthropology. Um, it's kind of the background I come from. I really like uh, Brian Larkin's work in northern Nigeria, Jesse Weaver Shipley um, in Ghana, and Brad Weiss in uh, Tanzania are three really great sources for that. Yeah, if you kind of Google around with media anthropology, digital anthropology, you'll come up with some of them. I wonder if you've seen much uh, of an intersection between micro lending and uh, and digital innovation in Africa. Yeah, um, I just got it down. Um, I haven't seen it much in Senegal in my own field because micro lending has not necessarily meshed with the same kinds of NGO distribution that digital knowledge, right? So that's really happening in these mobile labs, the digital training. Um, when it comes to the relationship between micro lending and tech startups or entrepreneurship, I think that would be a really productive and exciting place to explore. Because the micro lending I see is often around merchant stuff and, um, you know, buying livestock, things like that. And that makes a lot of sense. I've seen it work really in really beautiful ways um, with the, particularly the women's communities I work with in Senegal. If there were some way to turn that and distribute that to the kinds of people who need it really, which are women, um, especially uh, mothers, um, women who are aging, if there were some way for them to tap into tech entrepreneurship, I would like to hear about it. So we, maybe we can imagine that, you know, as we move forward. I really like that idea, but I haven't seen much of it. I could stand corrected, but yeah, I think those two worlds are just kind of separate, but they don't need to be. Yeah. Talk about Africa as being uh, there. You know, Africa is one monolithic thing, but a huge continent with a lot of differences. And so many questions like what countries are doing different things? What are the factors? Where is help most needed? All that kind of data. I'm sure you've got all that somewhere back in. I try. I, yeah. Okay. So there's this, there's this amazing blog called Africa is a Country. Have you seen this? 
Oh, please go. It's so good. And they are, they're tracking a lot of African digital making and African media making and pop culture there. It's called Africa is a country because it's a, it's tongue in cheek, right? The idea that this entire continent is monolithic. Um, of course it's not. It's really complicated. And that's what, that's what's so hard about writing a keynote like this. Cause I just want to geek out about the specificities of everything, but I can't. But what I can tell you about Africa right, is that these practices, as disparate as they are, they hang together, not because they're geographically co close together, because they're not in a lot of ways, but because of the historical trajectory of Africa and Africans in world history, and because of their relationship to what we call North Atlantic modernity, this project of globalization that really, um, you know, hit its stride in around 1492, right? And because of Africa's relationship to that, because of the relationship of blackness to that, because of the relationship of colonialism to that, there is a shared project of self-making around Africanness and blackness. It's a really complex and contingent term. And that's why things like Oh, poor Robbie with humanitarians of Tinder. But that's why I think that Coney, Coney, um, are really difficult for me to witness because what it does is flattens Africa into a monolith and places Africans into a place of response. We, we watch them from afar. They're not engaged. They're not able to use the agency that they very much possess. So it's not that we're not giving them voice. They have voices. We are not listening to the home because we're not used to it. So um, that's the beginning of those politics. I could go on and on, but um, I think Africa as a country is a great place to start pulling out specific threads. And one place we can pay attention, especially as tech folks, is the urbanization. I mean, there's so much cool stuff going on in these urban centers. And the urban centers are totally connected to the distant countryside because people are constantly circulating between the two. Um, so I think focusing on what's happening in the underground clubs of Johannesburg or the outer suburbs of Dakar um, can be really fascinating and really interesting. So that would be a good place to start. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that one blog. Uh, are there other resources that have access short of like flying to car and pop some cars with people? How can we here in Portland have access and just simply see it? I feel it's like kind of kept away from us. There's not an easy search term to go for. Do you have any other suggestions like that? Oh, it's so funny. I've been spending so long on these plots. Like I'm every day. I did after. So, um, yes, there are some. You know what I was thinking of doing that I'll totally do because of some of the specificities of these questions. I'll jot that down and I'll put it on my blog. Yeah. Oh, here. Um, for culture and code. So if you, you go to my site, maybe by Friday, I'll have a blog up with a sort of abstract of the talk and some links. And a really good one, if, you're, if you want to hear stuff, is called Awesome Tapes from Africa. And they basically take these cassette tapes and digitize them. And uh, yeah, the politics are complicated around it, but generally there is a... Um, willingness on the part of Africans to collaborate and put their stuff up online. If they weren't, for instance, getting royalties from it in the first place, there's kind of a moving archive. Um, and I have a ton of stuff. I mean, a crazy thing is I spent two and a half years in Dakar. I mean, I was there. I got grants from Mellon and P. I just kept getting these grants because everybody was excited about the stuff. And it's all sort of sitting on a series of hard drives in my house. Like when, when Researchers start getting um, resourced to put to make online digital archives. That's when you'll start getting the good stuff. The thing about doing this kind of research is we're like we have to by trade be extremely meticulous about our ethics, and we have to have signed consent forms, and we have to have long term collaborations, and we have to be willing to withdraw things from the archives. If our consultants decide they no longer want it up. And so that process is very long and complicated and it's super tricky. And I, to be honest with you, a lot of the resources that go to that kind of research are drying up in the contemporary crisis in higher ed. 
So something we can think about is how industry can fund and resource anthropologists to do this kind of work. So it's not only cool for us as individuals and what we like to listen to, but it's good for industry. It's good for everybody to know about what's going on out there in terms of creativity, in terms of digitization, in terms of youth popular culture. So Africa as a country is a good place to start because it'll shunt you out to some of these other blogs. But I'll post a list of five to ten really good ones. I'll post some stuff on African hackers, too, because there's some cool stuff out there I know people would be interested in. Thanks. Um, I just had a question on what you were saying about marginalized communities and what they needed to be involved. You mentioned that uh, this was someone else's list, but space, staff, and stuff. And my question was related to how you think systems play a role in that. Um, part of the reason that these marginalized communities were marginalized in the first place was because of the systems that, you know, Western systems that were designed in a way that excluded these communities. And, and there's still, it sounds like, those obstacles in terms of you mentioned PayPal being, you know, that's just an example of the way that financial networks may not include these communities. And I was just wondering if you had more thoughts on that. Yeah. The one thing that I realized is, oh, well, thank you for that question. I think that's a challenge. First of all, let's think about it together because it's a good one. It's complicated. I don't know the answer. But by way of beginning to imagine... Systems. I mean, the thing that was so amazing to me during my fieldwork in Senegal was code switching from the Wolof language to the French language to the English language to other linguistic systems. One thing I was perpetually fascinated by and completely blown away with was the ability that Africans cultivate in themselves and culturally to be able to switch from system to system, from metric to English, is it, you know, from one from one way of met from Mac to PC, um, from a, from the tiny SIM cards to the bigger SIM cards, from the five day a uh, five time a day adhan call to prayer and prayer to you know basing the day around that to basing it around the particular weather patterns of this part of the Sahel to basing it around the business day in the west that so corresponds to what the French are needing in the in the business district that there is an ability in that contingency that is absolutely crucial and important and it's I think it's a huge takeaway that tech can learn from how to harness it how to think about systems. I mean, they're never closed, first of all, but what's fascinating is living in places where the fact that they're overlapping is completely part of the textures of everyday life. Because we live in overlapping systems here in Portland. Some of us have religious beliefs. Some of us have ethnic backgrounds. Some of us have family values. Some of us have, you know, really demanding jobs. And somehow all of these systems that come from different parts of our backgrounds and different parts of our civilization all manage to, to articulate themselves in us. And I think some of the times when we get anxiety is when we have to put them together, right? When we have to put our spiritual life into conversation with our work life, into conversation with our family, or what have, whatever, whatever your um, cultural, the textures of your cultural being are. And so I'd be really interested in finding out more about how we can name those practices and navigating the slippage between systems and harness that. I mean, to geek out like far beyond my capacity, but just for fun, I, I did like follow some threads to um, the existence of a tertiary computing, computing system, right? So there's the binary but you can actually go into a church and it, it generates all kinds of weird things. So Google that if you want to find out more about that. But thinking about systems that extend beyond the sort of binaries that we're used to in the West and that soft stuff that doesn't really articulate to one particular system. That's what anthropology is really into. But it's it's like the hardest thing in the world to talk about and to harness. Thanks.
Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to thank you for all the information you've been giving us. And um, I guess my question is, I know you've been talking a lot about what we can learn from Africa. Um, so I completely agree. And I think that, um, you know, what is it that we can really uh, try to incorporate into our thinking? Because I think sometimes we are um, bound by what we think is possible. And just seeing some of the things you've said, it, 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 in Africa, they're turning it around. Or they're not turning it around because it's not, it, it, for us, it looked like they're turning it around to really look at it differently. Yeah. But it's the way they're coming from. And so what you talked about, diverse, how much we can learn from that. So is there, and you probably, you probably said them, but is there one thing that we can really take to try to look at things in different ways that we can take from Africa? And you may have already said it. Oh. It's so tricky because I know, I, you know, the question of taking something from Africa has these reverberations that sound terrible and they sound terrible because of it, but it's not you. No, it's this is the language that we use. This is the language that we use. And so it's so hard to write this talk because I want to make sense, but I also want to imagine what it means to always be engaged instead of extracting. And that is such a tricky thing to talk about in the context of capitalism. But one thing, I think the most important thing that, to answer your question, um, I think the most important takeaway is the question of making something out of nothing. It really goes back to what Ashila Mbembe um, is talking about when he's saying we take this, these things that are broken, these systems that are broken. What we find when we find all of this waste these computer monitors littering the most beautiful beaches in the world in Dakar, Senegal, right? These are broken systems because those are supposed to go back to the manufacturer and they don't, right? And it's maybe, it could be the French who are shipping it, shipping these down to their former colonies and just dumping them there. That's a broken system. And the fact that we know that people can take some of these broken things and make incredible new systems from them or incorporate them into functioning systems. One, I might argue, is the cultural life of Dakar, where I was working. That is a system that functions. It functions. It works. Um, that when they're taking bits and pieces of broken things and incorporating them into that, I think that's really beautiful. So we can call it making something from nothing, or we can call it being resourceful and problem-solving and willing to do that and to and being culturally and having that sort of make do as a cultural value, I think is really important. Thanks for that question. <laughs>